Okay. So let's, let's get going. So uh, my name is uh, Joe Rozovsky, and I'm with Mark Gerstein at Yale. And I'd like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me, and also all of you who are still here late in the day and are going to be here much later. <laughs> Enjoy. Um, so the, this session, which I'm going to be talking and followed by uh, Tom Gingeris, is about um, using ENCODE data to analyzing uh, the, in terms of the analysis of non-coding RNAs. So what I thought I'd present is some work that we did about a year and a bit ago, uh, looking uh, at the comparative analysis of non-coding transcription uh, using ENCODE and mod ENCODE to do a sort of a comparative transcriptome analysis and see what we can learn about a human transcription using uh, ENCODE data. So the, a brief outline of my presentation is going to be sort of focused on uh, three uh, components. One is a little bit back of background, and this sort of actually sort of goes to the, sort of the beginning of the ENCODE project. And for those of you who were part of ENCODE at the beginning, you could realize, remember that this was a little bit of a, a talking point. So it was about the discovery of pervasive transcription, then um, follow up with a, a sort of more a recent look at a pervasive transcription in the context of using ENCODE and modern ENCODE data with the advent of next-gen sequencing, and then uh, sort of drilling down a little bit more detailed in terms of pervasive transcription in the context of uh, transcribed pseudogenes. So before I talk about uh, non-coding transcription, um, let's put in context uh, what we know about sort of protein coding annotation. So actually, if you look over the last uh, decade or so, the number of protein-coded genes, and when I talk about protein-coded genes, I'm thinking about sort of protein-coded gene loci, the number of genes, not the number of uh, uh, isoforms, has actually become very stable. The number, uh, so what I'm plotting here is the different annotation sets over the last decade or so for the human, worm, and fly annotation sets. And basically, you see the number of protein-coding genes has sort of stabilized Early on, if you go back a decade before this, these, these counts were actually wildly fluctuating, but these are basically stable. So the number of isoforms per loci has increased, but the number of total loci has basically become stable. Now, of course, what I, we, I'm going to focus on is more in terms of sort of non-coding uh, transcription and non-coding annotation. So one thing happened um, about just over a decade ago was with the, uh, with the advent of custom tiling arrays, people were able to assay the amount of transcription that there was in the human genome uh, in an unbiased fashion. And basically, when they did that, uh, using these uh, tiling arrays, they found that there was a significant amount of transcription occurring outside protein-coding genes. And this was termed uh, pervasive transcription. And the first uh, publication that documented this was from Tom Gingeris's group, uh, where uh, Kaprinov et al. way back in 2002 found that there was an order of magnitude more uh, transcription than uh, purely accounted for by annotated exons in the genome. So if annotated exons compose 1 or 2 percent of the genome, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of the genome was, being, uh, was transcribed. And then there were uh, uh, follow-up uh, publications from Mike Snyder's group, and then these were repeated both by uh, Gingeris and, and Snyder in the context of the whole genome. And then when uh, pilot ENCODE uh, st uh, started, which was uh, the, the pilot ENCODE paper was published in Nature in 2007, um, and this focused on 1% of the genome, the co conclusions of that were that about 15% of the bases represented in the unbiased tiling arrays were transcribed in at least one tissue. So this was confirmed that there was a significant amount of transcription going on in the human genome that is not simply accounted for by uh, protein coding genes. And um, if you, you can sort of visualize that, so these are these signal tracks, and this is from using, as I said, these uh, custom tiling arrays that would tile a chromosome in a sort of unbiased fashion. Of course, you would have to skip repetitive elements. And when we look at sort of the signal map that you obtain from a tiling array, you see that corresponding to the exons, you see big blips. Exons are transcribed, but you'd find lots of sort of transcriptions in regions like here. Yeah, 
So this should potentially correspond to either a retained intron or novel exons or something else. And this was, things like that would account for the additional 10% of the genome. And just to add that sort of those numbers of 10% were actually, because it was somewhat controversial at the time, were very conservative estimates of the amount of novel transcription. Now, um, the way at the time uh, we analyzed uh, that sort of data, because as I said, it was uh, tiling array data, was there were algorithms such as MinRun, MaxGap, in order to identify regions that were transcribed. And that at the time, I think we still called, we called the, these regions TARS, transcription active regions, or alternatively called transfrags. So if you sort of looked at the signal map along uh, from the tiling arrays, you could segment the signal into regions that are transcribed. And some of these TARS would correspond exactly to known exons. Some would overlap known exons, but potentially would have sort of the boundaries that don't exactly agree. And then some would correspond to just novel regions of transcription that weren't previously annotated. So um, when we published these results way back when, um, they were, uh, these were somewhat controversial. And um, even though we've talked earlier today, we've talked a lot about or we've heard a lot about sort of regulatory uh, sort of thing, in terms of transcription, um, a lot of the sort of the fact that a, a great portion of the genome is transcribed, um, a lot of people didn't really believe. And this is from a, a PLOS biology uh, piece. They concluded that the majority of the sort of pervasive transcription or novel transcription was due to technical artifacts. So one thing I want to just emphasize is that this analysis that I'm showing you for four was using the tiling arrays. These were all done using replicate analysis. So these were, uh, these were results that you obtained that were biologically reproducible if you repeated the assay. So these were not just, not just due to sort of noise. Okay. Now, one of the criticisms of the results from about this pervasive transcription was all, all, this was all done using tiling arrays. Now, tiling arrays were great in terms of you being able to tile the genome, however, they had problems, and that's part of the reason we don't really use tiling arrays to do uh, these sort of assays anymore. And one of the main reasons is um, tiling, tiling arrays uh, had issues of cross-hybridization. So a lot of the oligoprobes that tiled your region would have either sort of depicted your matches to the exact reverse complement of the thing you were talking, targeting, but also you'd have specific cross-hybridization and then you'd have sort of more non-specific cross-hybridization. So this was an issue which made some people so quite skeptical about those results. But of course, with the advent of uh, next generation signal, uh, sequencing, we could do the equivalent on a, uh, a transcription array-based assay using RNA-seq. And even though the example I'm showing at the bottom is showing using ch for chip, but the, the, this, the, the idea for the RNA equivalent of this is the same you had sort of array-based signal which became much cleaner when you, had, when you used uh, did the, RNA, the, the sequencing equivalent or RNA-seq. Not to say RNA-seq doesn't have its issues in terms of mapping and stuff like that, but it was a lot cleaner assay. And actually this is just for, for, the, for sort of amusement. If you look over the last uh, couple of decades, and this is uh, NIH funding uh, for grants that involved the, the term uh, microarray versus sequencing, you can see sequencing has sort of basically blown up, while microarray sort of plateaued in the mid to, uh, mid to late 2000s, it is declining, which we all know. There's a lot more people doing sequencing-based assays than arrays. So, uh, in order to, one of the, uh, in order to address this issue of sort of uh, pervasive transcription, uh, we, uh, well, this wasn't the main goal of this project, but this was one, one of the things we could do using this data. The NIH, NHGRI funded um, the Mod ENCODE project to parallel the ENCODE project. And part of the reason for doing Mod ENCODE was to do the equivalent types of assays in the model organisms, worm and fly, and to be able to compare against human to see what we can learn in human by doing this comparison across these three very distant uh, organisms, these three metazoans. 
Now, in uh, 2014, we published this paper, which summarized uh, the results of a huge amount of data. So the blue is the RNA-seq data, the, bl uh, the dark blue is the RNA-seq data, the light blue is the CHIP-seq, and then the, uh, the green is the, uh, the chromatin uh, modification, histone modification data. And even compared to the modern code publications from 2010 and the human ENCODE paper from 2012, the 2014 papers had significant deltas in terms of additional data compared to those previous publications. So in total, there's about 3,000 data sets comprising about uh, over 100 billion uh, reads. So we wanted to use this resource to address the question of pervasive transcription. So, one, so it's in order to do this analysis and look at the amount of transcription we detected, one has to be very careful in order to be able to set these, uh, the data sets from different organisms on an equal footing. So we set up a, a way to uniformly process all the RNA-seq data in the companion across e th all three organisms and we used this method to set the threshold across all three organisms because all three organisms were sequenced with different number of tissues to different sequencing depths and the genomes obviously have different sizes. So I'm not going to go into too much technical detail, but if you look at the exon discovery rate as a function of a novel tar discovery rate, you can set a threshold at 95%, which lands up actually being a a fairly conservative threshold for detecting transcription um, so that you could set the threshold uh, for detecting transcription uniformly across all three organisms in a consistent fashion. So when you do that, or let me um, just go before. So we did that. And one other thing we're going to do, which I'll summarize in the next couple of slides, is to use all this transcription data in addition to all the other ENCODE data that we had available to try uh, predict novel uh, non-coding RNAs. So we had this uh, paper that we published a couple, uh, about five years ago where we used a machine learning approach in order to predict novel non-coding RNAs using known, novel, uh, known non-coding RNAs and a variety of different uh, features and we chopped up the genome up into windows and calculated each of these features for those windows and then using a machine learning method it actually landed up using a random forest approach. And you could see that even though secondary structure lands up being a very strong feature, by itself it's not the sole feature. By integrating multiple features you get improved power in order to be able to predict novel, uh, novel non-coding RNAs. So we used this method and we applied it to the data. So, in summary, before we uh, looked at a non -coding, uh, novel non-coding annotation, we could look at annotated non-coding annotation that we had in all three organisms. So this, at the top, we've got uh, exons of protein coding genes. And we can see that in the human genome, exons comprise about, and this includes uh, UTRs, comprise about 3% of the genome. Worm, it's about 34. Fly, it's about 28. And then we could look at uh, the equivalent numbers for pseudogenes. So pseudogenes is about 1% of the human and worm genome. Fly, it's uh, significantly less. And then there's a variety of uh, uh, non-coding RNAs, annotated non-coding RNAs, as of the, annota the, the, the best annotation available in 2014. So this includes uh, microRNA precursors, tRNAs, snoRNAs, sRNAs, link RNAs, and pi RNAs. And when you add up all the non-coding non RNA annotation, what you find is about 0.6% and about 2.5% of each of the worm and fly genome are transcribed in terms of annotated non-coding RNAs. So if you add up protein coding genes, pseudogenes, and all annotated non-coding RNAs, this is basically the sum total of all annotation, things that are annotated to be transcribed in each of these three genomes. So we wanted to look at, beyond anything that's annotated, what is novel non-coding uh, non transcription in these three genomes. So when we do this, using the thresholds I showed, which we picked uniformly across the three genomes, what we found was about, 30, uh, about a third of the genomes outside annotated regions. So outside exon mRNAs of exons, exons of mRNAs, pseudogenes, and annotated non-coding RNAs, we found about a third of these three genomes 
are transcribed. Now, that phenomenon of uh, pervasive transcription was initially uh, reported mostly in the context of the human genome. So a lot of people thought this was specifically a phenomenon of the human genome. But actually what we're showing here, if you analyze the data in the equivalent fashion, you find this result is basically, it doesn't matter which genome you're in. And these, across these three very distant uh, organisms, you're basically finding the same result at a pretty stringent threshold. So this is conservative and reproducible in terms of these are results that are repeated when you do the experiments in replica. You, found about, you, you find about a third of the genome is being transcribed. Now that doesn't mean that a th this third of the genome is necessarily biological function in terms of making transcripts that do something specific, but a certain fraction of them might be. So when we use this method that I've mentioned two slides back, to predict using the supervised machine learning method to predict novel non-coding RNAs, you find you can predict about another percent of the genome. So this is small. So the, the number of novel non-coding RNAs that are of the type that we already have annotated, it's not going to add that much more. But there's still a large portion of this unannotated, trans unannotated transcription that's going on that we don't really know what its cause is. So, one of the obvious questions people ask is, uh, what is the sort of expression profile of the, these TARs? And these are the novel TARs. So, if you compare it against protein coding axons, so this is frequency versus expression on a log scale, you see that protein coding axons tend to be more highly transcribed than these novel ones. However, the novel ones do have a smaller number, but there are some that are very highly expressed. And you could also look how uh, these uh, novel transcription, uh, occur, where they occur in the genome relative to other things. So one thing we looked at is in the context is how they relate to the positions of enhancers or these uh, distal hot regions. And distal hot regions are basically high occupancy re regions which are probably another type of regulatory element, maybe enhan enhancers too. And what we find is a significant fraction of these sort of occur within these regulatory elements. And you actually can do the, the Fisher exact test and just compare to where things would occur by chance and you find a significant enrichment that these, uh, this transcription is not just randomly occurring in the genome. Even though it's a, a third of the genome, it's occurring at these sort of regulatory sites. So, I think this gives you another evidence, even if these sort of, uh, this novel transcription is not necessarily making RNAs where we know the function, it's sort of indicative of regions of the genome that are sort of biologically active or biologically important. So maybe they cause, it's an enhancer and this is sort of some ER, e RNA sort of nearby or something else. It's just, there's a lot of stuff going on in these regions. So um, just to continue this, we wanted to look at, um, if we could actually sort of take these uh, novel transcribed regions and sort of uh, see whether they correlate with sort of uh, ne uh, nearby um, annotated axons or non-coding RNAs. And what we found is when you do that is you could find these novel transcribed regions um, that uh, strongly cor uh, have strong correlations with uh, protein coding genes or non-coding uh, genes uh, in each of the three organisms where you find sort of an orthologous uh, protein coding gene or non-coding RNA in each three organism and a corresponding non-coding RNA that has similar uh, correlation. And you actually, you can find examples where they're correlated versus and anti-correlated. And the inference is that these novel things are actually, even though you don't have sort of syntony between the three organisms, you can find an orthologous non-coding RNA in terms of the behavior and the sort of relative position to the, the, the orthologous uh, gene. So um, just uh, changing uh, focus a little bit, so I come from uh, Mark Gerstein's lab and Mark's lab has uh, focused for a long time on pseudogenes and he, in his mind, and I, I probably agree with him, pseudogenes are among the most interesting intergenic elements in the genome. And uh, formal properties of pseudogenes, they're inheritable, they have, uh, they obviously by definition of homologous to a functional element, and 
the sort of default assumption or default position a lot of people have is that pseudogenes have no function. However, using ENCO, oh, so, so just as a reminder for those who may be not quite familiar, there's two me mechanisms that you can create pseudogenes, either by sort of genome duplication or you have uh, a transcribed uh, RNA that is uh, retro-transposed and sort of inserted back into the genome and it acquires sort of a variety of different mutations such as premature stops, frame shifts and so on in order to disable the gene. So this, the, the pseudogene can't function at, in this, as the same as the parent gene because it's the, the actual protein coding uh, potential of the pseudogene has been disrupted. So um, the lab has sort of uh, uh, been involved in annotating pseudogenes in the genome. So we've got our uh, own pipeline for doing this. And as part of the GenCode project, we've been collaborating with um, GreaterFinder, which is Santa Cruz, and Havana is at Sanger, to combine the annotation output from the three different pipelines in order to uh, get a consensus set of pseudogenes that is the, basically the consensus set of pseudogenes, and this is part of GenCode. And what, we've in, what I'm going to show you is we gonna, we've annotated these pseudogenes by uh, combining with 1,000 genomes data, but more importantly, ENCODE uh, data to see what we can say about whether these pseudogenes are really dead. And what you see is now people have reported pseudogenes being transcribed for a while now, but a lot of people were quite skeptical of that because, time? Okay. So I'll go through this quickly. So people have reported that uh, pseudogenes are transcribed, but people were quite skeptical because they would say, well, it's just co-transcription or false positive uh, transcription from the parent gene, that the parent gene is transcribed and you're just getting sort of sequence reads m with mismatches mapping to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the pseudogene. However, this is example when you have lots of data, and this example is done in WORM, is you can see that if you look at the transcription of the pseudogene relative to the parent gene in a variety of different uh, tissue stages, you find it's not correlated. So this can't just be as a direct consequence of the parent gene being transcribed and reads mismapping. I mean, this is uh, uh, not correlated. And when you do find this approach, you can find that conservatively, there's uh, probably more than a thousand uh, human pseudogenes being actively transcribed. And we've done uh, experimental validation using RT-PCR, uh, using primer-specific RT-PCR to prove that these things are actually transcribed. And this is the, th uh, the one slide I just wanted to emphasize. Um, so what we did using ENCODE and mod ENCODE data, and not just the transcriptional data, is we took all our pseudogenes in human, worm, and fly, and we layered on all this functional annotation data. So you can sort of differentiate those that are transcribed, those that have uh, active polymerase, those that ha are, have active chromatin mark, such as uh, K27 acetylation, and those that have uh, transcription factor binding. And what you find is the result is there's a small number of pseudogenes for each three organism where you see all these things occurring. But there's a whole sort of spectrum of stuff in the middle where they're sort of partially active, where maybe you don't see polymerase, but you do see transcription, you, you do see uh, some sort of chromatin mark, uh, active chromatin mark. So the consequences of this is that there's a lot of pseudogenes that are potentially have some sort of, that aren't functional in terms of their original protein coding gene role, but it potentially have acquired some new functional, and this is one form of pervasive transcription. And this is some examples. And they have, in the literature, there's some known examples, uh, specific cases of uh, transcribed pseudogenes that have been known to acquire new functions, such as endogenous sRNAs, microRNA decoys, and so on. So just to summarize, I'm not going to go through this in detail, um, just gave you the history of pervasive transcription. Um, our results demonstrating that pervasive transcription is in fact and is actually conserved across all of these three model organisms, including human, and that um, uh, transcribed pseudogenes are, can be well characterized, and there's lots of evidence that there's many, tra uh, many pseudogenes have a lot of uh, biological activity and um, have some interesting potential uh, roles. And just for the last slide, just to emphasize, so this was done as a big uh, coordinated project in 2014, and uh, it was led largely by Mark Gerstein, 
with the, uh, and a number of members of Mark's lab, and the data was uh, principally from Brenton, Sue, Tom, and uh, Bob, and Christina and Baikang uh, led the, the pseudogene effort, which I reported on at the end. So that's it. Uh, in your talk, you mentioned the software uh, predict non a normal or normal uh, non non coding RNA. Is that software part of an encode project? Is yeah. that released somewhere? Yeah. Um, if you, uh, I'm not sure if it's uh, the the link is on the current encode. I know it was on the previous iteration, mm -hmm. but you could definitely go to the, the w our website. Okay. Go, go see lab .org and it's all available for download. And my second question is: Does the encode project add any kind of a new? Uh, long non coding RNA to the annotation, like uh, uh, gene code annotation or yeah. enzyme annotation? Uh, in terms of non coding RNA? Yeah, yeah, yes. normal, man. normal, normal. Yes. Yeah, okay. Sure. Uh, I mean, that's so this, of course, is, most of this was fo focused on ENCODE 2 data, mm -hmm. but there's a significant eff effort as part of ENCODE 3 mm -hmm. to identify novel long non coding RNAs, other types of non coding RNAs. And I think, I don't know if Tom, that's probably what Tom's going to be talking about in the next talk. Okay. Thank you.